another bank just shut down. Regulators today abruptly closed Signature Bank. Kinds of uncertainty surrounding the banking sector tonight. Markets tumbled in North America and Europe, dragged down by banking stocks and alarm about Credit Suisse. The two biggest geopolitical rivals of the U.S. want to counterbalance the dominance of the dollar worldwide, and Russia is increasingly embracing the yuan. I am an ardent defender and a lifelong defender of civil liberties. And Bitcoin is both an exercise and a guarantee of those freedoms. Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin versus the banks. And I've got two guests on today. I've got Greg Foss, who was with me a few weeks ago. And then I've got a new guest here, uh, Lawrence Lepard. How are you guys? Doing great. Milan. Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me back, Milan. Uh, yeah, Larry's a, a, a trooper, and uh, I, I appreciate everything he does for the space. So um, I hope you, uh, Larry and I, become fast friends. I hope you like him. You you come to like him as much as I do. So uh, uh, anyway, over to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I kind of think of like the Mount Rushmore of uh, Bitcoin figures. And if I had to put a bunch of faces, yours, your two would definitely be up there. I was talking to Guy Swan and I said I put his face up there, too. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really stoked to have both of you guys on here. You come with a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and not only that, this is kind of like a personal episode for me, because like my father in law, he, he you know, he's been investing for for decades now. He's a wise man. He's a smart dude. Uh, but he just does not get the value proposition in Bitcoin. And, you know, if, if he's feeling that way, I know there's some older, more conservative investors that feel the same way, too. Um, you know, the goal here isn't to orange pill him, but it's to kind of maybe maybe to get him to think a little bit more critically about this thing that he just sort of is avoiding. And for people that are kind of walking the fence, not really sure, you know, should I jump into this thing? There's a lot of a lot of talking points I've got for you, sort of counter arguments to Bitcoin that I think you guys can address quite well. So why don't we start with this um you know one thing that he'll often say to me is well warren buffett like you know he's a wise investor but he's saying like get that away from me i will never touch that stuff so uh greg why don't we start with you how would you counter that well i appreciate your father-in-law's concerns because very few things in life are 100 percent certain okay and even fewer things are in, in investing are a hundred percent certain, but let's start with this. I'm a math guy. I'm trained as an engineer. I believe math is the base layer of language, which is to say, doesn't matter if your second layer of language is English or Chinese or French, everyone speaks math. Math is the universal language. And it's the base layer of language. And I'm trained as an engineer, and I tend to look at math as being truth, okay? So one thing I can say with 100% certainty is that fiat money is programmed to debase, and it will debase at an accelerating basis over time because of the debt spiral. So if you start with that 100% certainty, and again, very few things are 100% certainty. You ask yourself, how do I protect against that certainty? And I happen to believe Bitcoin is the best protection that man has ever designed, man or woman has ever designed. From that perspective, I believe owning zero Bitcoin is irresponsible risk management. So if you want to tell your father-in-law that he's being irresponsible, by investing alongside Warren Buffett, who also has not done the work, then go ahead. But I will stand by the statement that owning zero Bitcoin is actually more risky than having a proper portfolio allocation. And every investor is different. My portfolio allocation is going to be higher than his portfolio allocation. But if you own zero, it's implying that you are 100% certain that Bitcoin cannot succeed. Then I'll ask you, so what are your assets that you're using to protect against the certainty that fiat money is debasing? And he may say gold, and I'll say that's good, but I think Bitcoin is better. And he'll say, I own real estate, and I'll say that's good, but I actually think Bitcoin is better. Both of these are what's called hard assets. And he might say, I own bonds, 
And I'm going to look at him square in the eyes and say, you are a fool. Because you have lived the last 30 years of interest rates going down. And now they're finally ticking back up. And your bond portfolio is getting shredded. And guess what fiat money is? It's just credit. And so fiat is debasing and all of this debt spiral, which is a certainty, is debasing because it's a fiat contract. And you ask your father-in-law this for me. If he owned, owns any bonds, he failed mathematics, or he can own bonds and protect that by owning Bitcoin. It's his choice. But if he only has one leg of the stool, He's not as good an investor as he thinks he is. So with all due respect to Mr. Milan's father-in-law, you need to do more homework, sir. That's absolutely the case for many investors in the world who have not done the homework on why Bitcoin is the best hard asset. And there are others that will protect against the certainty, very few things are certain, sir, of fiat debasing. Over to you, Larry. Yeah, I, I agree with ex everything uh, Greg said. I come at it from a slightly different angle um, to address the Buffett question. I mean, Buffett is an older man. Um, I believe he's in his 90s. I know his partner is 100. Um, and he's never been particularly forward thinking or particularly technologically savvy. He, he missed a lot of the techn technology trends uh, that have taken place in the last 20 or 30 years. And he's benefited enormously from operating in a, in a fiat system. Um, he, you know, he is a contillionaire in the sense that by being able to get inside deals and buy things cheap, like he did in 2008, when he bought a, you know, a pref in Goldman Sachs, knowing the government was gonna bail it out. Um, he, he lives and breathes and benefits from the system that we now have. And so, you know, like Upton Sinclair said, it's hard to get a man to understand something that would hurt his pocketbook. And uh, Bitcoin definitely hurts his pocketbook. And so, I don't think he's taken the time to really understand it. Or if, if he does, it's unclear. He's a smart man. Perhaps he does understand it and he recognizes that it's an existential threat to, to the game that he's running into what he does. And so, um, you know, either, either or, it doesn't matter. The allocation of zero is dead ass wrong, as Greg has pointed out. So um, just because a good investor, a historically good investor who operated in a fiat system doesn't support it, I don't think that alone is a reason to disqualify it as something you want to hold in your portfolio. Um, because, you know, he also didn't pick up on the internet. He, he now owns Apple, but he was very late in buying it. He doesn't tend to be very forward thinking. So, um, you know, which is not to say he's not a good investor in terms of picking up cheap assets and watching them appreciate. He's done a great job. And I'll, I'll qualify it, Larry. Excellent. He is a very good investor in the system that he can play. Okay. Right. Again, he has a, an advantage that the rest of the world doesn't have. That inside advantage allows him the luxury of questioning another asset that could challenge his playbook and certainly challenge his closer to the money printer Good advantage. Doubt. No doubt. No doubt. So, so I, you know, I, I, I don't I understand your father in law's admiration for him. I get it. I used to admire him as well. Uh, that with me, that's faded over time as I've watched his behavior. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't disqualify it just based on that. Let's uh, let's keep going because you had some other excellent questions that your father-in-law asked, and I'd I'd like to try and address those too. Sure. Uh, just before we move on, I just want to bring up the point. So, Greg, you had mentioned fiat debasement, and I mean, yesterday he was actually over at my house, and we were uh, we were speaking with a representative um, for my son's future RESP. Uh, my in-laws are kind enough, they're investing in both of my children's educations. And we were essentially looking forward at how much tuition is going to cost 18 years down the road. And it was close to $50,000 when only years ago I was paying around seven or eight. That's so Canadian that's a, University, Larry. That's Canadian University. U.S. University is well past 50000 per year already. Right. I just, I just finished paying for my youngest university. The bill last year was over $70,000. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. um it's terrible. What I'm curious, what did the financial advisor recommend? Oh, yeah, actually he talked about the company's portfolio and like at one point he was talking about how conservative it is and uh, he mentioned that we get into bonds and that's when I'm going, "Oh, no." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, anyways, yeah, yeah it is it, what it is. Yeah. But, you know, one of the common arguments, of course, is uh, Bitcoin isn't backed by anything. It's, uh, you know, the, he says that the U.S. dollar, it's backed by the land, it's backed by the businesses and even the products that it makes. So what do you guys think of that? Go ahead, Larry. Okay. Yeah, we were having this conversation before we got on the, we first started recording, Milan. I think it's necessary for people to do kind of a mental shift and understand what, what is money. Um, and Robert Breedlove has done a great job of this. And so has Sailor. Money, money is really a ledger at its core. Um, money is is the most. It's defined as the most liquid good in Austrian economics, the thing that everyone is willing to accept in exchange for goods and services. And um, gold emerged as money because it was a liquid good that that was tangible, that everyone knew what it was, and you couldn't you couldn't cheat uh, with with gold in the old days when you have gold coins and they were doing transactions in those. But but think about this: even before gold, before mankind even discovered gold there was a form of money and it's shown in the old caves of, of prehistoric caves where there are tally sticks and there are markers that show that these guys were keeping score. You know, I killed three deer, you killed one deer, I owe you a deer. And, and so they didn't have dollars to exchange, they didn't have gold to exchange, they didn't have anything to exchange. They were just keeping score, who owes who what? Money is really a social obligation. If you have money, you can then take that money and exchange it for food or gasoline or services or labor, whatever you want to exchange it for. And so when you've accumulated money, it means you've, you've added more value than you've consumed and therefore you have savings. And so, you know, the, the thing I think a lot of people do is they, they look at the older versions of money as being physical and they don't recognize that really money is a ledger. I mean, there, there aren't dollar bills sitting in your bank account. There's just a digital entry in your bank account. So we've already digitized money. You know, we've got, we've got a ledger based economy. And so if your bank says you've got $10,000, you may not be able to go down there and take out the dollar bills, but you know that you have $10,000 because your bank says you do. So, um, you know, with money as a ledger, you know, then suddenly it, it kind of brings on another dimension. And that is if you could have a secure ledger that represented true digital scarcity. And here's the key. What, what Bitcoin is, the thing that your father-in-law has to get over and the thing that everyone needs to fully understand is that Bitcoin is a foundational technology. And Greg is a as an engineer really understands this extremely well. Discovering Bitcoin was like discovering flight or discovering electricity or discovering you know, radio waves. I mean, it's, it's digital scarcity. It's a way to create an entry that's scarce and immutable. And digital scarcity has never existed before. And immutable digital scarcity is a really important technological development, which then allows you, because of the way the system was constructed, to know that there's a limit on the amount of these digitally scarce coins that can be commit, uh, created. And that's 21 million. Of course, we're at 19 and change now. So because you have this true digital scarcity, this thing, these Bitcoins are actually coming to serve as money. I mean, all of those who bought Bitcoin believe that it is money and will continue to be money and will increasingly grow as money. And, and again, it's, it's because it's liquid and it's socially accepted. Now, if we all didn't believe in it, it wouldn't be money. But if you look at its characteristics, and that is the non-inflationary principles, the lower stock to flow ratio, the immutability of it, and the ability to transact very quickly over very long timeframes with instant settlement, in that respect, it's much better than gold. I mean, try to send a billion dollars of gold from country A to country B. You know, you'd need a jet, jet airliner and a, and a security team. So try to send a billion dollars of Bitcoin, you can do it in 10 minutes. So um, it, it really is, in my opinion, it is a form of digital gold and it will ultimately it will surpass gold. And people need to get around the notion that you have to have something physical for that thing to be called money. In a digital world, a digitally secure token that is immutable can act as money. That's, that's how I would address it. I love it. I love it. Um, and for the audience out there, uh, Larry, may have given a off the line, off the record, uh, or prior to me joining a history of who Larry Lapard is, but I encourage people to understand that Larry Lapard is a hard or sound money advocate. Sound money advocate, meaning hard assets. Larry saw gold for all of the value that gold provides and believes that Bitcoin is actually better in that it's verifiable. How much gold is there in the world? We don't know. 
How much gold is in seawater? We have an estimate. At what price does it pay to mine gold out of seawater? Meaning, what price would gold have to attain for it to be economically feasible to mine the gold that's in seawater? Well, see here, right now, gold supply is growing at approximately, at this price, at approximately 2% annually. That's just a guesstimate. But my question would be, what if the price of gold were to double or even go to $10,000 an ounce? Do you think the supply would remain at 2%? No, of course, supply would increase because ore bodies around the world, including the ore body called seawater, could become profitable to mine gold out of that ore body. And all of a sudden your supply has increased. It's no longer as scarce as it was before. Why did gold achieve a level of money? Because of its scarcity. It was verifiable, mostly by sight, but also by weight and density as currency or as money. What happens if the price of Bitcoin triples from here, Milan, to the supply? What happens? Absolutely nothing. The supply is programmed. The scarcity is insured. So that is the argument as why Bitcoin has value, intrinsic value as money or as a ledger. I'm going to bring my credit hat to the table here because I spent my entire life in credit markets. I actually don't think of Bitcoin purely as money or as a digital ledger. I love it for those characteristics. I believe Bitcoin is insurance. It's credit insurance. It can be valued using credit default swaps on sovereign debtors and actually come up with an intrinsic value. Why? Because Bitcoin is anti-fiat. Bitcoin is the antithesis of what fiat money is. And therefore, if people are out buying insurance on sovereign debt because they are concerned with the ability of those debtor nations to pay back their obligations, Bitcoin can be that insurance policy, and it's even better. That insurance policy has no counterparty. I don't need to buy this insurance from a big Wall Street investment bank. I don't need to buy it from an insurance company. I can buy it as an insurance policy. So I value Bitcoin as intrinsic value as insurance. Okay, I'm a credit guy. Fiat is credit. And I want insurance on that credit. And there's a market of open market, large, sophisticated players who buy and sell insurance on sovereign nations, including, yes, sir, the United States of America. There are people that are concerned that one day the USA will not be able to pay its bills. Now, I know they'll be able to print money to pay those bills because that's what they've done the whole time, increasing the supply of that money. But what if there's a form of a soft default where people like in Venezuela just say, I don't take this paper money anymore. As payment, it's worthless. I need insurance on that scenario. That's what Bitcoin is for me. And I can actually calculate the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. And it's online at a place called NakamotoPortfolio.com designed by the CIO whose Twitter handle is Alpha Zeta, a brilliant young man from Brazil, Hoffa, has my intrinsic value of Bitcoin calculated on NakamotoPortfolio.com. Real time. I can tell you under various scenarios that Bitcoin should be valued at at least 400,000 US dollars per Bitcoin using that model. And it's trading at less than one-tenth of that amount. Okay, it's trading at about one fifteenth of that amount if we had to do the math. The point is, I like to buy cheap insurance. And Bitcoin is extremely cheap insurance on the Fiat Ponzi. And you can think of it as money. You can think of it as insurance. You can think of it as asset. You can think of it as digital gold. And I'm going to bring, bring my engineer back to the table. I think of it as digital energy. And thermodynamics, right. the first law of thermodynamics. Yep. 
Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, just transformed. Bitcoin is the transformation of electricity and otherwise natural resource energy turned into electricity, mined into Bitcoin to preserve your, your energy over time and space as either a savings mechanism, as either an insurance policy, or as money, I don't care how you define it. It quite simply is the most brilliant technological and financial instrument because this insurance contract has no time decay. It has no counterparty risk. It is actually a long volatility asset, which means in a world of short volatility assets like equities and bonds now, and this is your insurance policy, which means it's a long volatility. As the, in, as the world gets more risky, the value of in Bitcoin goes higher intrinsically. I can't tell you how perfect an option Bitcoin is. I can explain it to you. But if you're still stuck in the Warren Buffett mentality and your financial advisors is telling you to own bonds, oh my God, you guys are so, so out of date as to how to properly manage risk. Very simply. So Greg, I, I agree with you regarding the insurance thesis you have. That's actually one main reason why I sort of got on board with Bitcoin. And um, I, I think it's one of those things that at least currently my father-in-law, he, he doesn't see that um sort of value proposition because he thinks this, the current system we live in that it works fine you know and as larry you said like he he's benefited from the system that he lives under and i think that's why his eyes haven't quite opened to it he thinks that the us is fine and as you said greg like they they will be fine because they're just going to keep printing their way uh, ad infinitum but that's so also what does the it problem. mean though milan take that extension if they're going to keep printing their way which means the fiat dollar is, again, 100% certain to debase. You need to protect yourself against that certainty. So I think we're closer, you know, it, every, you, the best way to build a straw man art, argument is you, to use their own logic and tell them, I agree with you. They're going to just keep printing money. It's the only way they can solve the fiat Ponzi. So if we agree on that, then what is your protection against that certainty. And so, I don't know. Um, look, I'm 60 years old. Larry's 66 years old. I'm not sure how old your father-in-law is. And I applaud him for his financial success in life. I initially thought Bitcoin was a Ponzi until I did the work, until I went as an engineer and watched the Bitcoin blockchain in action and said, oh my God, I'm visual. I'm seeing a living, breathing, beautiful, trustless, which means there's no intermediary, ability of transferring value over time and space. And there's no intermediary that's a bank or anything that can centralize authority that can control this. Takes time, right, Larry? I've spent thousands of hours studying Bitcoin. Yeah. To be clear, though, thousands of hours studying Bitcoin also includes thousands of hours studying why our system will fail at some point in time. And your father-in-law seems like a great man. He's trying to invest in your children's future. I love him. The problem is our children's future has been actually compromised by greedy politicians and boomers like myself who are too afraid to pay their bills. So we pull forward gains, future gains that should accrue to our children, we pull them forward under the guise of COVID relief or universal basic income or all of, forgive student debt, all of this stuff. The funniest thing you should do is tell, tell, tell your father-in-law, oh, don't worry, dad, we're gonna borrow the money to go to college, and then we're not going to pay it back because you know what? Nobody ever pays back student debt anymore. Like, think of all of this stuff that's happening. Anyway, I don't want to go on too much of a rant, except I love your father-in-law's principles. I applaud him for doing diligent planning for the future of his grandchildren. 
But I think as plain as the nose on our faces, guys, it's just mathematics. Do the math, understand why you need to protect yourself against the certainty of fiat debasement. Full stop. I mean, awesome. One of, the other, one of the other questions you're following last is it's not a physical bank note or a commodity. I mean, obviously a commodity you can touch and feel. I mean, touch and feel oil or corn or coal or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. a bank note really just represents a claim against the bank. You know, a, a stock certificate really just represents a claim on the earnings of that corporation that you've invested in. And what Bitcoin is, is it's really just a claim on a limited set of digital coins. And the two, you know, to be fair, I mean, people, you know, older boomers have asked me and say, you know, what are your concerns about this thing? What could go wrong? You know, I mean, it, it sounds too good to be true. And I tell them that the two, two concerns I have about it are that the technology would break or fail in some manner. And, you know, it's been going for 14 and a half, going, coming up on 15 odd years now. Um, and that has not happened. There have been, you know, um, there have been very, very few. I mean, like less, it's run successfully, you know, 99.99% of the time. Um, and the core developers all manage it and, and, and things are done by consensus. So, in a, you know, in a sense, there's no one, there's no individual point of failure. There's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's an open source piece of software that nobody can mess up. And it's just going to keep kicking out blocks for the next X number of years. So that would be number two, one. Number two would be if everybody lost interest in it and said, oh, you know what? This really isn't important. I don't give a shit about it. I'm not going to hold this anymore because money is a collective illusion. I mean, we all think the dollar has value because the U.S. government says it has value and because it's had value since 1945. And originally to get that value, by the way, it was backed by gold. Of course, we, we broke that in 71. And, and so... You know, everyone, what, what we're seeing here, and the reason this goes to another one of your final last questions, well, it's so damn volatile. Yes, it is. And that's because what we're seeing is we're seeing the early days of a new system emerging. And, you know, in anything that's new and early and emerging, you tend to get, you know, excess excitement and then excess, you know, depression or, or fear. And so things swing back and forth a lot. I was an investor in the internet back in 1993, and I recall very clearly a lot of people say, oh, this thing's bullshit. It's not going to turn into anything. I was like, no, 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 guys, this is really big. It's going to, you know, I mean, Paul Craig was saying, oh, the internet will never turn out to be more than, you know, a fax machine. You know, like, I mean, here's a, here's a, you know, a Nobel Prize winning economist, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, th this thing is being adopted slowly, but surely. If adoption were to stop or were to turn around, or if the number of use cases were to start to shrink, I would say, okay, maybe this isn't going to become what we think it's going to become. But as, as the three of us all know very clearly, day after day, month after month, year after year, the number of addresses is growing, the number of you know, buyers are growing. I mean, here's a big event. BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the United States, just filed to have an ETF. I mean, this is going to eliminate career risk for thousands and thousands of financial advisors who today could not put their clients into Bitcoin because it's one of those risky, you know, fringe kinds of things. But when there's a BlackRock ETF, and the CEO of BlackRock is saying he thinks this could be the future of money. Suddenly, that's going to be a wall of money that's going to come chasing after this. And let me, you know, Greg pointed out kind of the, the asymmetry of, of it all. But let me just give you some of the math. I mean, you know, Bitcoin today, what's the market cap on it? 500 billion, something like that. Something like that. I mean, yeah. I mean, Greg and I will debate this, but, you know, there's somewhere between 400 trillion and 800 trillion, depending upon what you include, debt and equities of fiat assets in the world. So that's trillion. And we're talking 500 billion in Bitcoin. So we're talking less than half a trillion of a four to eight hundred trillion dollar market. Nine hundred, nine hundred trillion, but let's not split okay. trillions. Greg, Greg always says it's bigger than I think. But whatever, it doesn't matter. The numbers are all extremely big. And the point is that as more and more of that market comes to recognize that the dollars and the things that they're accounting in, main, mainly dollars, but also euro and yen. Um, uh, is being consistently debased in a meaningful way. I mean, 42% monetary growth, you know, on the COVID thing. Um, they're going to start to say, I need something. I need to hold something, some asset. I've got savings and my dollar is buying much less. We all know that. We go to the supermarket, we see it. I need to save money in a form that will not get debased. And so the old traditional forms were real estate. Okay, that works, but they can tax it and you can't move it. All right, so let's get to more assets. All right, well, gold and silver were pretty good at that in the past, but 
even as Greg points out, gold supply grows 2% a year. And in 40 years, we'll have twice as much gold as we now have. You know, the Bitcoin supply is not going to grow. I mean, it's going to grow from the 19 million we have today to 21 when it's fully distributed. But that's not a lot of growth. And, and the 21 is a hard cap and won't ever be changed. And so as a result of that, you know, some of that 900 trillion, as Greg would say, is coming after the half a billion, the 500 billion in these coins. And I mean, just as an example, if Bitcoin were to grow to be the size of gold, as a savings mechanism. People would say, you know what? I'm going to put my savings into Bitcoin instead of gold. Bitcoin would be $600,000 a coin today. Okay. And it's at 30,000. So, you know, and I, I sincerely believe that will occur. Um, it's going to take some time. Gold's not going to disappear. And I still own a lot of gold. In fact, a lot of people ask me, I say, what's your allocation? And I say, I'm half gold, half Bitcoin. Um, and, 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 and Larry, beautiful, beautiful. Regardless of whether we agree what the total financial assets in the world are, I'm a debt guy. So I look at what's called enterprise value. So I always include total global debt. Okay. And total global debt itself is over $400 trillion. Right. I would not sell my gold to buy Bitcoin. I would not sell my real estate to buy Bitcoin. And be careful here. Don't cut this and say, boss, I'm not finished yet. I would not sell gold or real estate to buy Bitcoin if I still own bonds. That is where your allocation comes from. And that is the largest asset class or debt is the largest asset class in the world at 400 trillion. Right. So let's play the game Larry was playing. What if 10% of total debt was converted into Bitcoin, which I think is low, but it should. What's 10% of, of total global debt is 40 trillion. What is 40 trillion divided by 21 million? I'm going to save you guys doing the calculations. You just have to knock off a few zeros. What is it, Craig? It makes, well, 40 trillion divided by 21 million is approximately 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin. Right. F in tech. Guys, this is the asymmetric That's opportunity asymmetric of your path. lifetime. That's an okay. and, it and is absolutely trading right now at less than one one hundredth, meaning one percent of its potential, just on the mathematics that I laid out. You clowns who don't know how to manage risk and sit back and say you're a hundred percent certain Bitcoin ain't going. No, you cannot be a hundred percent certain about a price prediction on Bitcoin. What you can do is create what's called a probability of distributions of Bitcoin's future price, which includes zero, which includes it getting the market cap of gold, which includes it getting 10% of total global debt. All of these are different spots on a continuous distribution of probability outcomes, of which any single one outcome is infinitesimally small. But when you do probabilities and statistics, if you've been trained in that, you understand that you run an integral under the distribution. You sum up little pieces. And then you get what's called unexpected value. And if that expected value, based on your probabilities and your price targets on those particular outcomes, is higher than it's trading today, you're supposed to buy some. Correct. You can be 100% certain that Bitcoin is going to zero. I dare you. I dare you to be that certain because that would be the most silly investment you could ever make. You can trade Bitcoin. Bitcoin will trade on a daily basis for different reasons. Supply and demand. Headline risk comes across. Yes. But over time, if you run the math over time, I believe Bitcoin is the apex predator asset in a global system of financial assets that, respectfully to my friend Larry Lapard's totals 900 trillion. Because <laughs> there's 400 trillion of debt and 500 trillion of other stuff that is smaller than debt, including gold that we'll call it 10 trillion. My God, you people need to look at your mathematics and understand how zeros you lose track of the zeros when you get into trillions, okay? So, well, and, and another point that, that's important to make here, Milan, to your father-in-law, 
it's just very volatile. And I get that. I mean, I, I've got a lot of clients in my fund who are gold holders and they say to themselves, you know, this Bitcoin thing, holy shit, it goes down 70%. I, you know, they could never put all their net worth. And I would never suggest they do, but it's volatile with an upward slant where the each high, each additional high is higher than the last one. And each additional low is lower than the last one. And so- No, the, the, each additional low is higher than the last one, not lower I'm, I'm, than I'm, the sorry, last one. I'm, 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 higher I'm, lows. Higher the, yeah, higher lows. And and so, you know, the, the issue here, the way you deal with that volatility, and by the way, it's the best performing financial asset in the last 14 years on both a return basis and a sharp ratio basis, which even takes account of that volatility, is, is your allocation. You know, so so you have a 1% allocation or a 2% allocation or a five or a 10, whatever it might be. And and you know, you don't you don't take all of your money and put it in Bitcoin. I mean, some of us have huge amounts of money in Bitcoin because we strongly believe in it, but but the point is. You know, when you have an asset where, I mean, we all know, and this is one of the beautiful things about investing and why I think I've always thought investing was a great career and I've made my career out of it is you can only lose what you put up and you can make multiples of your money. And that that's why this is a good game. And so I love it. And you know, Larry, the other thing is, here's the funny thing, Milan, I, if you convince your father-in-law to put, say, 2%, okay, that's a good start, 2% mm -hmm. of his net worth into Bitcoin, what do you think? is the first thing he looks at every single morning in his portfolio of net worth. That friggin' 2%, okay? The fact is he has way more risk in the other 98% of his portfolio, but he's gonna focus on that 2%. Why? Yeah. It's human nature. Okay, I'm actually just joined a, a fund where we are using a weighting of Bitcoin in combination with S&P. So that that particular instrument can participate in the upside of Bitcoin, but also buffer the downturns so that you don't get shaken out of your position. It isn't, you could do it yourself if you were a professional investor, but most people are not professionals. They tend to sell at the wrong time and buy at the wrong time. So over time, Wall Street is going to come up with instruments that will. I'm not going to say smooth the volatility of Bitcoin because it's always going to be Bitcoin volatility, but you can dampen the volatility or perceived volatility in conjunction with other assets in your portfolio. This is a game, not even a game. This is so important for people to understand. You're supposed to buy Bitcoin to protect against the other 98% of your portfolio. And much like you own house insurance, if you see the fire is coming across the canyon, you have fire insurance on your house, and you see that the fire is approaching, are you supposed to sell your fire insurance because the value went up? Or are you supposed to buy more? Because the likelihood of you needing fire insurance is now higher. Well, that's what Bitcoin is, people. You should look at it as when the price goes down, you're lucky because more people can buy fire insurance. I'm 100% certain the fire is coming. It's called fiat debasement. And so this is just a different, it's, it's a way of massaging. And Larry says, you have to handhold people. Managing money is a horrible, horrible profession, Larry. With all due respect, you and I have done it. it it's a horrible profession. But luckily, there's people who have thick skin and have uh, absolute... Uh, confidence that their outlooks are are sound and they're sound money. So, look, we're just two guys with opinions, but both of us have done the research that it takes to understand why Bitcoin. Then we got to get you into it in a in a way that you're not going to shake yourself out of it. You know, like if it's worth a hundred or 200 or 400,000 and it goes from 20 from 31 down to 25 are you happy or sad you can't shake yourself out of that position you're saying hey i can now buy more of it to get my proper portfolio allocation okay guys and that's again a risk manager's perspective to this whole thing risk is relative prices are relative and managing risk is a relative game I want to summarize one thing for your father-in-law. And Larry, I hope you'll agree with this. When the perception of risk is low, asset prices are high, 
and the world is giddy. But actual risk is very high, right? right? Perception of risk is low. Asset prices are high. Everybody's bullish. Actual risk, high. When the perception of risk is high, prices are low, confidence is low, actual risk is low. Yeah. Okay, that is the game here, is managing the difference between perception and reality. Yeah, that makes sense because at that point everybody sold off. Capitulation has occurred, so there the risk great is on. Great financial the, on the crisis. Line. Great financial crisis in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, when the S and P hit six six six, the sign of the devil. Was actual risk low or high at that point? Actual risk was low. Perceived risk extremely, extremely high. Didn't mean it wasn't going to go lower, but people. These are S&P 500 companies with cash flows based on capitalism. You could have called for the end of the world, and it did feel like it was ending, didn't it, Larry? I mean, it did feel like it was ending. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's I completely agree with what Greg just said about risk. I mean, that, that's Buffett's, you know, be greedy when other people are fearful and fearful when other people are greedy. Um, you know, buying Bitcoin right now is is a lot easier, in my view, than buying it at sixty eight thousand was. Um, and I was buying; I've been buying at both levels. I just I dollar cost average. I buy some every week. Um, you know, and then that's what I recommend. But you know, the the thing is, I mean, your father in law should ask himself. He should, you know, is he likely? Let's say anything can happen. He doesn't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, is he going to feel better under the following scenarios? He buys one Bitcoin and it goes to zero. And I'm sure he's done well enough that he can afford the $30,000 loss. Or he doesn't buy one Bitcoin and it goes to 300000 or a million. Where is he going to feel more regret? My I would say if it went up. <laughs> yeah, my suspicion is if it goes up 10x or 100x, mm -hmm. which I think it will in the next 10 years, um, and he's been told about it, and it's been explained to him and people who he respects, you and others have said to him, hey, you need to have an allocation here, not all of your money, but a small portion of your money. And he doesn't listen and he goes, no, 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 that's bullshit. I'm not doing it. Um, you know, I suspect in five or 10 years, he might really feel regret. And, and the other thing is, Larry, that's beautiful. Why would it go that high in price? Because his system is breaking down. That's right. As people realize that the fiat system that he has come to trust so implicitly actually is breaking down. Right. So be careful what you wish for. I don't actually want Bitcoin to rocket to a million dollars of Bitcoin because it would mean that our fiat system is broken overnight. And that's not what I want. I want a parallel system to develop. I don't want anarchy. I don't want war in the streets because the fiat Ponzi has broken. But there's plenty of examples of that happening historically when the respect of Fiat Ponzi breaks. As Voltaire, a famous French philosopher, said, all Fiat money eventually returns to the intrinsic value upon which it is printed. And what's the intrinsic value of a slice of paper? Zero. Unfortunately, <laughs> zero. So anyway, go ahead. Well, I want to come back to something Larry said. Uh, Larry, you said that the dollar is collective, a, a, sorry, a, a collective illusion, which I thought was a really great way of putting it. Um, essentially, it has value because we all kind of just sort of agree that it has value. Um, and so, like, one of my father-in-law's concerns is that, you know, there's all these cryptocurrencies out there. There's literally thousands of them, tens of thousands of them. Um, and when people start buying these up, including Bitcoin, uh, it's it's all FOMO, right? And he's saying, like, what if it all it takes is one rumor and this thing drops 70 percent 80 percent maybe even down to zero like what's the rebuttal there yeah so that's that's a great concern and and i i thought we'd get to this one eventually and that's where we get into you know bitcoin is not like all other crypto and a lot of people have dismissed bitcoin because most crypto is you know a founder who issues himself a lot of coins and then does an initial coin offering and goes out and sells and starts talking about how great his coin is and tries to pump the price. And it's a pump and dump so he can get rich and or sell coins into that into that marketplace. OK, 
and and that's that's what FTX is. That's what you know um, finance is. I mean, you name it. There there've been thousands of them. And so the problem, one of the one of the things that's been bad for Bitcoin and that's that Bitcoin people have had to overcome is the fact that there are a lot of parallel bad actors in the cryptocurrency space. And and what your father-in-law alludes to is dead ass right. And that's it, it's not and it's not just a theory, it's happened. I mean, you know, Celsius, Terra Luna, I mean, you've got and you've got big, well-known people who got tattoos supporting this shit before they got rug pulled and lost lost all their money. Um, so you know, so so it's extremely common. Okay, here's the thing that, that you've got to your father-in-law's got to understand: those things are not like this thing. Those things are entirely different than what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a distributed network of thousands and thousands of nodes that have the entire blockchain record from the beginning. There was no initial founder. There was a group of people who worked on developing the code. But, you know, and, 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 and basically thereafter, they set it out on the world. And the way you had to get coins was you had to be a miner. And so you had to actually verify the chain to, to receive new coins. That was the quid pro quo. And that's still going on today. And people are verifying the chain in order to receive new coins. And they also get fees. And over time, the coin reward will go down and the fees will go up. But the point is, no one person controls that. Even the SEC has said this thing is a commodity. It's not a security. It doesn't pass the Howey test, so it's not a security. And as a result of that, um, the, the odds of what you describe happening are zero because there are millions and millions of people who hold these coins. You know, as you, as you and I both know, you know, it's, it's like 70% of the coins have not moved in the last you know, year or two. The, the amount of coins that are available for purchase are quite small because a lot of people have bought them with a very long term time frame. I mean, it's as safe says it's, you know, we have long time preference. We know they're going to be worth a lot more in the future. We have no desire to sell them today. And so the underlying network of the blockchain and the miners that verify the blockchain and the miners that also process the transactions every 10 minutes, that's what prevents the that's what creates the immutability. And the notion that suddenly, you know, I don't know how many holders there are of Bitcoin in the world, but I'm, I'm sure they're probably north of 100 million holders. The notion that all holders of Bitcoin will all suddenly decide to dump at the same time, and I rate the probability of that as, as very close to zero. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just, it's not likely to happen. Now, having said that, you know, Bitcoin could go down a lot. I mean, it's had corrections of 60, 70, 80%. I mean, you know, when um, when FTX blew up, you know, a lot of people conflated Bitcoin with FTX. And so Bitcoin got hit, you know, when the Chinese miners um, shut down their mining operation and China banned Bitcoin for the third or fourth time, people thought that would be bad and the price went down. So, so don't get me wrong. I mean, bad events in the network or bad events in the in the press can hit the price of Bitcoin. There's no doubt. But it's been declared dead since it was a dollar a coin. You know, um, I bought my first coins at 300 bucks. I still have them. And, you know, it's at 30,000 today. And could it go back down to the 15,000 low of last year? Possibly. I doubt it, but it could. You know, do I expect it to be 100,000 within the next year or two? Absolutely. I do. You know, and I think after that, 300 and then 600 and then a million and then all the way up to Greg's 2 million. And, you know, oh. that makes sense time, right? And, yeah. and that's my target. It's not a certainty, but. Right. I'm going to give you some math here. So first of all, Bitcoin, not crypto. What yep. is crypto outside of Bitcoin? It's just fiat, people. Crypto outside of Bitcoin is just fiat. A centralized product where you can get more supply. There's no supply restrictions. And then you can say, okay, well, I'm going to come up with a better coin than Bitcoin because I'm going to have less than 21 million supply. And I'll ask you, okay, how secure is your network? And you'll say, well, it's just me and Larry Lapard, and we're trading it. And it's our two CPUs here. Or uh, 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 let's say we have an ASIC, special ASIC to mine the Foss Lapard uh, uh, secure coin. But guess what? That'll get hacked in a nanosecond. Bitcoin is the most secure network in the world, computer network in the world. So you have security, you have first mover advantage. And it's decentralized. Key, decentralized, not centralized. That is what other crypto is. And therefore, other crypto is fiat. Okay, back to my math game. 
Are you good at math? Uh, I'm all right. Math? What's that? <laughs> I'm all right. Okay, good. If my price target is $2 million, target, not limit, and it's got to go through Larry's targets before it hits my target. So he said 100,000 and 300,000 and 600 gets the pauses. Right now, what is the chance the market is giving me, Greg Foss, that my price target of over 2 million has a chance of succeeding? And then every other chance is that it goes to zero, meaning it's a binary outcome. It's not a continuous distribution. It's just two outcomes, either zero or Greg Foss price target of over 2 million. What is the chance the market is giving me right now that I'm right? I'm going to guess maybe like 5%. No, well, so what you do is you take the current price, trading price of Bitcoin, 28,000 bucks, and you divide it by 2 million plus, and you come up with slightly over 1%. Okay, here's the craziest thing. I'm not 100% certain my target is right, but boy, am I more certain than 1 point something percent. Okay, understand people, you see how this works? The market is telling me I have a one point change, one and change percent chance of being right and 98.5% chance of it going to zero. And I'm like, well, I don't think it's going to zero, but let's assume you are right that that left side of the distribution is zero because it's only binary. You're telling me I'm only one and a half percent likelihood of being hitting my price target. Guys, you're wrong in my opinion. So chip it in. I buy. You sell, I buy. That simple. I don't know if your father-in-law plays table stakes or goes to Las Vegas, but Las Vegas is all about managing risk and managing probabilities. If you take the house out of there, you know, cards and everything like that, understand that this is a probability analysis. And I just happen to think it's extremely cheap. And Larry is absolutely right in the way he looks at things. And I'm not going to put a time frame on my price target of $2 million. All I'm doing is measuring it in today's dollars. It's $2 million in today's dollars, people. Holy moly. It's like pulling teeth, trying to explain mathematics to these imbeciles. Okay? Really, it is very painful. Mathematics is a very difficult subject for a lot of people. And unfortunately, what is Bitcoin? It's math and code. Oh, boy. <laughs> Most people aren't very good at code. And there are very few people that are really good at math. So on the whole, we're fighting against a, an illiterate population. I like to say Bitcoin is an IQ test in risk management. And if you don't own Bitcoin, you have a pretty low IQ for risk management. Now, I know like one of the things that he's also concerned about this, this came back from a few years ago. I had a friend who was more into Bitcoin than I was at the time, and he was trying to explain to him what Bitcoin mining was, sort of how it works. And the takeaway for my father-in-law was that it's quote unquote printed out of thin air. Oh, and I mean, I, I I laugh when I hear that because I compare it to our modern day system. And Larry, you and I kind of talked about this before the recording. Do you want to kind of tell them why this is just a you know a false assumption? Uh, I mean, this goes back to Greg's uh, really excellent point that that Bitcoin really is energy. It's digital energy. Um, you know, you need to explain to him. I mean, I don't know how far you down the rabbit hole you've been with him, but you need to explain to him that a block gets created every ten minutes, and that the you know the the it, the block gets created as a result of solving a mathematical problem, iteratively solving a mathematical problem. That's what the miners do. Um, they, you know, we have global exahash, which is computing power. The Bitcoin computer network is the most powerful computer network on the on the whole planet by an order of magnitude or two. And as a result of that, you know, a block can only be created when a lot of digital energy has been spent to solve that problem and put those transactions together. So it, there's no way you can claim that it's it's printed out of thin air. It's printed very much based on a mathematical formula and the block reward does not change except every four years when the halving occurs. And so right now the block reward is six and a quarter coins every 10 minutes. In April of next year, it'll get cut into one half of that amount. 
and it continued. That, that will iteratively continue to get slower or smaller every four years until the last Bitcoin is mined out in the 21 something time frame. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not created out of thin air. It's created based on a mathematical formula. And that mathematical formula is driven by electrical energy. And the only way, the only honest way to get a Bitcoin is to contribute electrical energy to the network and therefore to get paid for your contribution. Um, new like Bitcoin. Yeah, new Bitcoin. Be careful. Yeah, the only way you yeah, get yeah. new Bitcoin supply. Right. To say, yeah, new yeah. Bitcoin. Right. And you can, yeah, you can transfer. Yeah. And so, um, you know, just like the only way to get a barrel of oil is to is to spend the capital to drill for it and pull it out of the ground, or the only way to get an ounce of gold, same story, is to mine it. The only way to get a Bitcoin is to contribute energy to creating money. And 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 really, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people smarter than me have said, you know, energy is nature's discount rate, right? I mean, Sailor and others have said energy is nature's natural discount rate. I love you know, it. It's the one thing that we all need to live on, you know, mm -hmm. without electricity, without oil, without coal, without sunshine, you know, the world stops. We all die. And uh, and and therefore, it's perfectly natural that the, the soundest form of money would be based based on and driven by energy. And so, you know, to, to spend and a lot of people say, well, Bitcoin consumes too much energy. No, because the fact of the matter is having sound money is the most important. It's the foundational layer of the entire economy. And so even if Bitcoin consumed a lot more energy than it does consume, and it doesn't really consume much compared to the total size of the economy, even if it did, it would be worth doing just because it would provide sound money, which allows people to make the correct economic calculations. I mean, the reason the world is as broken as it is right now, the reason the governments are running the deficits, the reason why we see all kinds of people hurting terribly as a result of the inflation. I mean, I'm sure this hasn't really affected your father-in-law because he's probably fairly well off. But, you know, if you do any digging around and look at the social statistics, I mean, people in all countries around the world are seriously hurting from the food and other inflation. I mean, we're seeing violent crime go up. We're seeing shoplifting go up. We're seeing just any measure. I mean, crimes of desperation, um, you know, suicides, you name it. You know, the world is in a bad place because the people that run the world at the top, you know, the central bankers who control the monetary supply have completely messed up the monetary system you know, in a fashion that has really caused enormous pain for the average citizen who's just trying to do a job and, and, and put food on their table. Can I just add to that? So yeah, again, as an engineer, I love uh, the an uh, analogy that Bitcoin is digital energy. And I love, I've never heard that, that energy is the global discount rate. It should be the global discount rate. The price of energy is the, the global discount rate. I believe that oil and natural gas. So one thing about the US dollar being the petrodollar, Milan, is the US is in a luxurious position of being able to print energy, aren't they? Because they can print money to buy oil. Holy crap. Like that's unbelievable advantage to the United States. Need more oil? Don't have it domestically. We need more supply from overseas. Let's just print money to buy that oil. I believe there will be a day when Bitcoin or oil and natural gas is priced in Bitcoin. Natural resource energy priced using digital energy. Again, as an engineer, I love this stuff, okay? It's the conservation of energy principle. And you can only do that with a decentralized, decentralized protocol. Otherwise, people would just print more of these things to buy goods and services, including natural resource energy, if they wanted to. The controllers, the centralized control of that protocol. But Bitcoin, decentralized, 21 million. No CEO, as Larry pointed out. So Bitcoin, oil and natural gas priced in Bitcoin? Damn, as an engineer, I'm just like, okay, well, how come it's taken so long? Do you think Vlad Putin is happy that he stored his reserve assets in US Treasury bonds and then all of a sudden got them frozen? No. Well, if he had kept his US dollar exposure in Bitcoin equivalent because he sold natural resource energy to the free world and got paid in petrodollars in return, he wouldn't get these things frozen. You can't, you know, you can't freeze Bitcoin. So Lots of reasons why Bitcoin is the perfect solution. As an engineer, I love Larry's explanation of it. 
It's beautiful. And did you know that over 100 years ago, Henry Ford, you know, the guy that invented the Model T, he predicted an energy currency would solve global war. Over 100 years ago, look, out, look at that statement from a brilliant man. Energy currency to solve global war. Well, what's, what's Bitcoin, you guys? It's an energy currency. Understand why this is the most beautiful solution to the criminal undertakings of the Fiat Ponzi. Not saying who's doing it. I'm just telling you it's criminal to steal future wealth from your children because you're too afraid to pay your bills now. But that's how politicians get reelected. And there's no other way I can say that we have a prime minister here in Canada who thinks that budgets balance themselves and knows that he's afraid of mathematics. He's, he's told people he's afraid of mathematics. Milan, I'm sorry. I would, ask, I would ask a question for you about your father-in-law. Sure. Is he aware of the risk of inflation to his asset base? And does he understand the value proposition of gold? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, he certainly doesn't understand the value of gold. I've, I've talked to him about that, and he does not. that doesn't seem to resonate with him. Uh, as far as the inflation piece is concerned, I think so. But I think he, he's just like his assets have performed well enough that it isn't enough of a let's say factor, like I said, he thinks the system works. So I don't think he's in any way afraid of, uh, you know, a hyperinflation event, uh, whereas I am. And that's why like, my mother who strictly owns, I mean, she owns a little bit of equities, but most mostly she holds cash. And I'm like, just buy something because when inflation hits, like really, it's, you know, your assets are bound to take off. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. If he doesn't, yeah, if he doesn't even, I mean, look, the mistake a lot of people make is they look at the last 40 years of deflation and they, they you know, and this is a human, natural human error. It's recency bias. They just assume it's going to continue. And um, those of us who've been in this game a long time and who've studied longer term cycles, 50, 100 year cycles, recognize that we've come out of an extremely unusual period where, you know, the long term bond went from 14% in 1980, you know, down to 50 basis points in March of, you know, or the 10 year, I should say, went to 50 basis points in March of 20. 23 and um or, or, no i'm 2020, sorry 2020 2020 covid march yeah, 2020 covid march and and that's reversed and we're now in a different world and we've underinvested in commodities we've underinvested in producing stuff and you know we've we've had a lot a lot of people leaving the labor force as the boomers retire you know you've got a pilot shortage which is why you've got pilots you know getting 40% pay raises and you know inflation is here to stay and so if you, you know, if you, if you take your investments and you look at them in a rear view mirror kind of way, you know, you might think, okay, having bonds and stocks is exactly what I should be doing because it's worked perfectly for me for 40 years. And what I would try to point out to him, I would, I would develop a list and point out all of the things that have changed in the past five years that, that argue against a continuation of that prior 40 years. And I would suggest that at a minimum, you know, look, I, I don't tell people you got to ditch all your stocks and ditch all your bonds and buy our stuff. But I say, if you don't have 10 to 20 to 30 percent of your assets in inflation protecting assets, which, you know, silver, gold, Bitcoin, real estate, whatever, you're absolutely insane. Because, you know, when when inflation really kicks in and it, it has to a degree, but it's calmed off a little now, but we're going to have another wave of it. And when it really kicks in, all this stuff is going to go up multiples. And all of the other stuff, the bonds and the stocks are going to get seriously hurt. And you're going to be really glad you had this hedge on, you know, and if we're wrong, you still got 70% of your assets over and the other stuff that's worked so great. So, you know, it, it, it's not and like we've taxed you incredibly, right? I need to, I need to add something because uh, I view stocks as a quasi hard asset. Okay. Not, exactly. not sound. And you can look over time that the S and P 500 has basically just kept track of m2 money growth okay right. it's a right. very solid correlation so right. therefore the s p 500 can be thought as your stable coin your your keeping up with inflation but bonds are not that okay and bitcoin is better than m2 excuse me stocks for protecting you against the 
inflationary, the growth of money supply to the extent that QE infinity is insured, that fiat debasement, because the S&P as a market cap weighting, it's self-fulfilling. It sheds its losers because more stocks fail than succeed over time, but it keeps adding to its winners and getting rid of its losers just by a sheer market cap weight. So all of these things are cool. Milan, um, I need to leave. And before I do, I'm going to apologize that I probably indirectly caused, called your father-in-law stupid, all right? Um, I'm 60 years old. Grant me the uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, forgiveness. Here's I'll, I'll turn my chip back over. I didn't swear. I didn't use the F word this whole podcast. I wanted to. I, I said you can't fix stupid. It's not that. You can actually can fix stupid a lot of times, and it's just through education. And that's one thing I'm extremely proud of, and Larry as well, is we're just out there trying to educate people how to manage risk how to look at the different risk parameters that are in the markets that you may not understand. It's a probability. I think I've used that word a lot. We know one thing for certain. Fiat debasement is 100% certain to debase. Stocks are a quasi-hard asset. Bonds are not. Bonds are a fiat contract. So if you know that fiat is debasing, you can pretend you're the world's greatest bond trader, but the only thing a bond is, is a fixed contract, a coupon that is paid over the life of the contract. And if you think you've made a capital gain on a bond, it's only because the open market yield or interest rate is lower than that coupon. And therefore that coupon is more valuable on a present value basis. So the price of the bond appears to go up. But all you've done is trading in, if you sell that bond, a higher coupon for a lower coupon. A 10-year bond in the US right now is guaranteed from now until the next 10 years to return you what over that time? The 4.30%, which is the yield to maturity. That's the guarantee, not including a default. You can say, well, then I see interest rates going down and therefore the price of that bond is gonna shoot up and I'll sell it like a pro. I heard that same argument when it was at 2% and these guys are now offside like 30 bond points, okay? The playbook has changed, as Larry said. When we started managing money, interest rates started at 14%. In fact, the US 10 year was 18% and went down to under 1%. Bond math is not easy, but understand what bond is. It's a fixed contract. So sell your bonds, not all of them, but to buy, a small portion of Bitcoin, it's not crazy to sell a small portion of your bond portfolio. And then if you've already sold all your bonds, I would suggest you look at the other less hard assets, which means you probably have 50% in equities or you have 50% in real estate. Well, you peel off a little bit of that to get what I believe to be the best hard asset ever created by man. I'll let Larry have the final word. Uh, which I very rarely do, but he zinged me pretty good by uh, by by wishing me happy birthday today on Twitter. I love you, Larry Lapard. Okay, oh. I sincerely love you. Oh, I love you too, man. Thank I you mean, for everything you do for oh. our kids and for the future. That's oh. all we're trying to do. Thank you, Foster. We're all fighting. Foster, the same before part. you go, I just you know again I want to thank you uh, for being here. Oh, for I'm not leaving. Time. I want the last word to oh, be Larry's, okay. but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, like, I'll, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> yeah, I just again want to just thank you being here on your birthday. I, you know, I appreciate it because you're you're doing so much for the space, and you know, hopefully, this session that we're doing really educates those people that are just again, they're kind of dipping their toes or they're they're just on the fence. They're like, I don't know what to do with this thing. You guys have really shed some light on something that people just don't know enough about. So I appreciate that. Yeah, the the other thing I would suggest to your father in law is it's it's a digital world. And so the times are changing and, you know, he's got to start thinking more digitally. I mean, think of all the things that have occurred, you know, PayPal and Venmo, you know, it's, it's just everything has changed and it's going to continue to change. And this is the direction that it's going in. The other thing I would encourage you to do maybe is buy him a copy of the Bitcoin standard by safe and, and, and suggest he read it. 
um, because if you if if you've read, I know you have the, the first half of it really is Austrian economics, and kind of gets you thinking about the fundamental problem here. And you've got to, I ask the gold question because you've got to really, and and Greg does such a great job of pointing out the the program to debase issue. You really need to understand the way the system is constructed and how the system is going to blow itself up. And then once you understand that, then you can start to think, okay, what's the best way that I should, given who I am and what I am and the risk tolerance that I have, how should I protect myself against that? How do I make sure my heirs come out with the most assets? You know, And I think you'll, you'll immediately, you read that book and you'll immediately conclude, oh boy, these bonds, I'm out of here, no more bonds. You know, now, and then you can debate whether you want equities or, or you know, real estate or Bitcoin or gold or silver, all those things. They'll all protect you in some fashion. But, um, you know, that you got to start with the underlying premise. I mean, you know, was he, I don't know what business he was in, but was, was he aware of just how broken and screwed up it was when 2008 came along and they bailed out all the banks and printed all that money? That's or a great when, question. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to ask uh, him about that. Ask him on that because the two big touch points are 2008 was like a wake up call for me, for everybody. It was like, holy shit. You know, mm -hmm. these guys aren't kidding. I mean, rather than let the system self correct, they are going to print the money to keep things going, which is going to make us all poor. And then 2020 was 2008 on steroids, right? It was like, oh my God. You know, you think 2008 was big. No, we can print $5 trillion and we can do it in 18 months and we can send checks to people and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, PPP and we're going to forgive these loans. And it was just, it was insane. And guess what? There's another big one coming. And with each of these, I mean, you know, I, I, there was a great tweet on Twitter the other day that said, you know, um, our taxes didn't get increased, but basically we're paying for the cost of all those bailouts because the price of everything we buy went up by 2x. You know, so rather than rather than increase our taxes, which everyone was screamed about, they printed the money, and that's why gasoline is now five dollars instead of two fifty. You know, because of the increase in the money supply, and and you know what he's got to recognize is that this will happen again. It has to happen again. It literally has to, or the system will collapse. That's Greg's point, and it's a great point. Greg has done a fabulous job of educating. He, you should. Greg, tell them your, the name of your um, of your website, the education website that you personally funded and supported and put out there, which is really a real a, a great site for people to educate themselves on on Bitcoin. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Uh, it's called LookingGlassEducation.com. So full spelling: Looking Glass Education, all one word. dot com. And it's uh, your your. Uh, understanding of how the system works and why inevitably uh we need bitcoin but this has been used to uh uh it was the genesis for the education diploma that was granted in uh, el salvador for the kids in the schools in el salvador it's quite so, an honor yeah yeah uh, it's it's uh, you know we're happy about me premier bitcoin me that uh, but it was our lady who basically did it a beautiful lady from uh colombia beautiful in all respects. Uh, and she lives in Boca Raton, Florida right now. And she's just committed to helping educate, uh, educate the kids. And she converted a lot of our thought process into uh, Spanish. And that was the basis of the education program being used in El Salvador. And now it's being used all over the world, that particular Bitcoin diploma. So, uh, shout out to my partners at um, uh, LookingGlassEducation.com, Seb Bunny in Whistler, Canada, Dahlia Platt in Boca Raton, Florida, and Daz Behan in Western Australia somewhere. I know it's a huge frigging country. So somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Australia, quite honestly, I'm not even sure if he's on the East Coast or the West Coast. I think he might actually be on the East Coast, Australia. Great guy. These guys are putting their heart and soul into educating the world and it's working. Okay. And yeah, you know what? It was my idea. James Lavish was involved at the outset. Uh, but um, right now it's these three people who are running it and uh, they're doing it. Why? Because they care about their children and their children's children uh, understanding why you need to protect yourself against the fiat system. I'm going to summarize. I said last word to Larry. I want to be very clear. I don't want the fiat system to collapse overnight but we're 
driving towards that mathematical eventuality with speed limits exceeded because the government doesn't care anymore. We're sending billions of dollars to Ukraine, printing it. We're sending, we're, we're, we're forgiving school loans. We're doing all sorts of things. Not saying any of this is bad. It just adds to the government deficit. And that deficit ensures that they need to print more money to pay the interest on that deficit. Very simply, there's not enough money in the world unless they print it. That's the economics of a debt spiral. And here's, okay, the, thing, guys. here's the thing, Milan. Yeah, we got we to gotta go. But here's the thing. With respect to your father, don't give up. Just keep working on him. I've got many, many investors in my fund and many, many people my age and older who were extremely skeptical and negative on Bitcoin when I started with them on it. And some of them are so orange pilled now you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and it's it, it really is a matter of education and knowledge. And you know, just just if if they have an open mind and they're willing to learn, you'll get them because it's it, the the argument is you know the logic is very compelling. Um, if they have a completely closed mind, you may never get them. That's that's Warren Buffett. But if they have an open, <laughs> if, if they have an open mind, you're going to get them because and and do. Do yeah. one thing for me, Larry, and I really have to run here. I'm one minute late already. Guys, hug your father-in-law for me. Hug your kids. Like, it's not worth losing a family relationship over a disagreement on Bitcoin. I believe that you're going to do the right thing for your children, and your father, your, your father-in-law is going to do the right thing that he thinks for your children as well. And God bless him for that, okay? We're just here to try and make the world a better place, and I believe that's so much easier with Bitcoin. Why? Because there's no disadvantages. Anyone in the world has the opportunity to buy Bitcoin at the same price as I do today, as Larry does today, or you know who else? As Warren Buffett does today. Do you think the rest of the world had a chance to buy Goldman Sachs preferred stock at the same price Warren Buffett bought in the great financial crisis? No, sir. That privilege was granted by being close to the money printer, okay? Bitcoin does not care. There is no discrimination, age, color, creed. Bitcoin doesn't care. Signing Perfect. off, signing off, Larry. I got to go. Yeah, I got to run too. Okay. All right, guys. Th thank, thank you. you guys thank so you much. Guys. Take care. All right. Thank you all for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. You can find me, Milan, on Twitter. My handle is at MilanNesic84. It's at M-I-L-A-N-N-E-S-I-C-8-4. If you want to write me, maybe you have a question, an idea for a show, or even a guest, my email address is Milan at btcvsthebanks.com. Lastly, if you want to help support the show, see it grow, you're welcome to donate via Lightning, and the address to send to is BTC vs the banks at fountain.com. That's F O U N T A I N dot FM.